let's talk a little bit about where we are right now in the Dobbs case that overturned Roe in terms of how many bans have gone into effect, et cetera, what's being done about it. We all know that Dobbs overturned Roe and Casey and said there's no constitutional right to abortion. The way it did it was being an attack on all the liberty jurisprudence. First, they say there's no constitutional right to abortion because the word abortion is not in the constitution. So neither is the right to marry, neither is the right to contraceptives, and certainly not same-sex intimacy or marriage. They also say that liberty only protects rights that are part of the history and traditions of our country. Both these things are devastating to other rights like contraception, same-sex marriage, the right to marry anyway, because they're not part of the history and traditions of our country. And I don't know about you guys, but the idea that women's liberties, people who become pregnant's liberties are based on the history and traditions of a country whose history and tradition includes the oppression of women, especially African-American women who were enslaved, raped, forced to carry pregnancies to term. And then at the, on the other end of it, who were denied the ability to have children when they desired children through forced sterilizations. This history, of course, being applicable to many women of color, the mentally impaired people who are institutionalized, men and women, were denied the right to have children. They could be sterilized. So again, this idea that, that our rights are based on our history and traditions in an oppressive society with incredibly oppressive history and traditions, I think is terrifying. If you think back to when the rights were created, Women had no right to vote. African-Americans didn't have the right to vote. Certainly African-American women didn't have the right to vote. And even after women got the right to vote and African-Americans supposedly had the right to vote, there were many restrictions on the right to vote that prevented their, their voting. And look at today, the Republicans are gerrymandering so much, they're doing it in order to dilute the power of the vote of African-American minority and low-income communities. So our history and tradition is not necessarily a place we want to go to when we think about our liberties. And the implication of that is that any new recognition of, of a group that's being denied liberty will never be able to succeed under that view. We will never be able to establish that there's a group of people who are being denied the right to liberty, any new group that hasn't previously been recognized under the constitution. And in fact, we could roll back rights, certainly um, the right to the right of sex equality for women, which Justice Scalia used to argue was not a protected constitutional right for pre precisely this reason. But I think this is really nothing less than an attempt to return us to this era, extreme oppression, so I'm about to go on and talk about what the impact of Dobbs is, both on the other constitutional rights and where we are now in terms of states and bans on abortion and other actions that are going on. But I'll stop here again to take questions. It's me, Anita. I have a question on that history or tradition. Would that include the amendments? So in other words, if there was an amendment to the constitution that allowed for abortion, would that then safeguard abortion? I mean, yes, that would safeguard abortion because the right to abortion would be included explicitly in the constitution. So this history and traditions doctrine, if you will, is meant to give meaning to the right to liberty. So the, so the amendments, the women's rights to vote, et cetera, those aren't being challenged. No, they're not being challenged here. And there's a specific protection for the right in the, in the constitution. So those aren't being challenged. My point is that their view of what history and traditions are go back to the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment. And at the time of the adoption of the 14th Amendment, and certainly for years and years afterwards, 
there was no constitutional right to vote for women. But now there is. The tradition was not of protecting women's equality, including the right to vote. To your point, we would need an ERA, something that specifically said there's a constitutional right to equality for women that still under their theory would not necessarily protect the right to abortion because the, now the right to abortion is not protected. You could argue that the history and tradition of the last 50 years should matter. They already rejected that view in Dobbs. They overturned Roe anyway. So they're talking about the history and traditions. I don't know if you guys saw the Saturday Night Live skit. They did a skit about the history and traditions of our country dressed in 18th century, 19th century wear and beating women. Husbands could rape their wives until shockingly recently under the Constitution. There was no right not to be raped by your husband. Two clarifications. I believe Professor Smith said women didn't gain equal rights until two years before Roe. Would you ask her to explain what she meant? There were cases challenging restrictions on women's rights. There was one case that challenged the differential access to low beer. 3.2%. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And their age limits were different for women who gained access to 3.2 beer and men didn't until they were 21. And the court on sex equality grounds said that men had the same right and there was a constitutional right to sex equality. So ironically, some of those cases involved restrictions on men. Justice Ginsburg became sort of famous for using those cases to establish a constitutional right against sex discrimination. So that's what I meant by that. Why don't we go to Previn? Thank you. You mentioned that the argument of the court was on the the basis of history and tradition. Uh, Someone should have reminded them that history and tradition are fluid. They are not frozen in time. Whatever I said a nanosecond ago is part of the history and will become tradition someplace along the way. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And that has been pointed out in various ways. In fact, there's a number of schools of thought, right, about constitutional interpretation among scholars. There is something that's been termed living constitutionalism, which is that you should base these notions of liberty and the meaning of liberty based on what people have come to expect and believe as a society or what's just just and right under the principles of the constitution. The principle of liberty, how could we live without something? How could we be truly free without certain rights? And that this does evolve, our beliefs about that evolve, and also people's understandings of what liberty means change. Hopefully they change for the better over the years. Yes, I agree with you completely about the evolving constitution, a living constitution. Of course, on the other side, there are people who are textualists who are looking for the word abortion in the constitution and originalists who believe that the constitution should be interpreted based on the original meaning, what was going on at the time the amendment was adopted. Even originalists, many of them recognize that what Scalia used to call a faint-hearted originalist. In other words, he does it sometimes and not others, and he's inconsistent about it. Look at the Second Amendment, the well-regulated militia and muskets are what was meant. The right to arms at that point meant muskets. And now we're talking about AR, whatever they are, 47s, 57s. Sometimes, just to be fair, there are writings of the people and what they were thinking of at the time. And those sometimes get pulled out. (laughs) I have a question. I'm wondering, this pertains principally to state laws. 38 states currently have what are called stand your ground laws. I would expect that a pregnant person in any of these 38 states should have access to abortion. A stand your ground argument, right. Under... These states existing stand your ground law. She doesn't. 
Yes. Should she? I don't know. Those laws are pretty nasty. I'd rather keep it under other things. But yeah, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. So I just thought one question people ask a lot is, is there a risk now from Dobbs? Does Dobbs impact the right to contraception, for example, the right to same-sex marriage or same-sex intimacy? And Alito says, oh, this case doesn't apply to those rights. They're not affected by this decision. That's just a really dishonest statement because of course, this case itself, Dobbs, doesn't rule on the issue of access to contraception or access to the ability to engage in same-sex intimacy or to get married. The actual decision involved a law banning abortions up to 15 weeks or after 15 weeks in Mississippi. But the court has completely destroyed the basis for these decisions. It said the right itself has to be in the constitution, contraception, marriage, same sex or any sexual intimacy, not in the constitution. And the history and traditions also of our country do not support those. In some cases you can make some argument about it, but the court has already clearly rejected that view. And so what that means is in a case coming up, challenging those things, if that decision follows the reasoning here, if it's the same judges and they're gonna follow this ridiculous ruling, then those rights are completely at risk. And we're already seeing attempts by the states to regulate, uh, ban certain types of contraception. They're gonna first go after emergency contraception, which they claim prevents a fertilized egg from implanting in the uterus. And so they claim that's an abortion. That's factually wrong. It doesn't prevent implantation. And it also, there is no pregnancy until implantation. So it's not an abortion, but they don't care about that really. What they're trying to do is get to all contraception. So they'll go one step at a time. And if you don't believe us, if you don't believe me, there's a number of writings about this notion of the only type of sex that should be happening is procreative sex in marriage, and that anything else is called sexualityism and is a false, crazy belief system created by radicals in the 60s and 70s which thank God for the radicals in the 60s and 70s, sexualityism. So that's the uh, constitutional impact of other rights, the downstream impact of this decision. One thing that I read about recently is pharmacists who refuse to prescribe Cytotec, which is a drug that allows the relaxing of the cervix, the cervix being at the end of the uterus, even though it wasn't being used for an abortion, it was being used for insertion of an IUD and is used in order not only to reduce pain of the IUD assertion, but to make it uh, more effective and, and safer. This pharmacist, he's either has bad intent and just doesn't want to allow the insertion of any IUDs because he believes they're abortifacients, even though they're not, or he is maybe a person of good intent, but is scared that he will be accused of aiding and abetting an abortion because that's been threatened in many states. So that's the actual chilling effect it's having even on things that are outside the abortion ban, non-abortion providers. Thank you so very much. I'm not sure you can hear everybody applaud. Thank you. I mean, this is really fun. I love talking to the humanists.